Okay. So I'm a dad, you know, primarily I'm a dad. I, I, I have a day job, you know, I work with patients, but I've always thought since the day my son was born and pretty much full-time dad. And uh, short history on me, you know, when my, when I was like 10 years old, my parents divorced, I had two sisters, it was three kids, we were pretty young, you know, and my mom left and my father raised us um, pretty much as a single parent. And this is back in the 70s, and that was kind of crazy. So anyways, uh, I, I've always kind of identified with fatherhood and it's really sad now because my son is in his final year of high school and uh, I'm just going to miss him terribly. I, I can't even tell you how sad I am now. He just started his last year of high school on Monday and, you know, he's going to have a great life. He's going to go on and take on the world. I'm super excited for him, but it's so hard to let go of your kid, you know. So I'm just kind of struggling with that. But that relates to the blackboard because my son is a mathematician. He loves math and uh, loves life and loves lots of things. And so one of the father-son projects we did uh, last year was he just said, Dad, i got to have a blackboard. Every mathematician has a blackboard. So we went out and we bought these blackboards. And I, I lugged one of them to my office and he has the other one of them. Uh, uh, in his little cottage where he does his math. And then, you know what my son did? This is really cool, too. He created this company, uh, Tutors for Opportunity. It's his volunteer organization. The kids volunteer, and they do all this really great stuff. And all these, like, smart... There's my son on the far left there. All these smart, geeky science kids kind of ganged up and created this Tutors for Opportunity thing. So, anyways, that's the Blackboard story. But now I can use the Blackboard for teaching, which is great, because um, I think that's a good idea. All right, I think we're good to go here. It looks like everyone's kind of streamed in, so let's get started with the real stuff. So tonight's going to be um, a lot. You know, tonight is, for me, uh, really emotional because there's a lot happening in functional medicine. I want to catch you guys up on a history. Those of you that uh, aren't old enough to know um, about all this stuff, you know, if you weren't around 25, 30 years ago, I want to catch you up on that. And I want to talk a little bit about the future and what's happening in functional medicine right now. And we're going to do this all through looking at the HPA axis. And start to think about, uh, there's a new testing technology available, which is what this class is about tonight. It's called the Dutch test. And I just thought we, we should give a whole historical perspective so we understand where we started from, where we are now, where things can go, how the technology can change our practices, and, and look at it that way. And then also talk a lot about what, um, what functional medicine really is at some fundamental level. Okay, so this is me, introduction, you guys are pretty familiar with me probably. Um, for those of you that are brand new, haven't done one of these before, been in practice for a long time, about 24 years, I've trained a lot of practitioners in uh, my training program. We get the best doctors in these classes. If you're interested in a class, you should sign up for it. You just meet the coolest people. It's all online, you learn a lot, and we're really in the trenches working on practice management, working on clinical application stuff, and we have a really good group of practitioners. I also recently completed a study uh, with the Mayo Clinic, which I'm very proud of, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit tonight, but not a whole lot. But the study was on adrenal function, and um, I worked really diligently on this for quite a few years, and so, you know, ended up generating literally boxes full of documents. It all boiled down to this one short thing that actually got published, which is right here. Happy to send you guys copies of this if you're interested. Just let me know. And so, evaluation of a functional medicine approach to treating fatigue, stress, and digestive issues in women. And that was what we did. And it came out really positive. I worked with Sue Cutshall and Larry Bergstrom on the study. And, you know, we saw some really good results in uh, the women that we worked with. And also in, created some new uh, analysis tools, new ways of looking at this, because as you know, it's really hard to um, study or analyze what we're doing, because our, our research paradigm in our conventional medical world is, you know, like for a drug trial, basically. And this was a multifactorial thing. I mean, it, it could have been that they liked me or didn't like me. That's why they got better or didn't get better. It could have been related to the diet changes or to all the herbal products that we used. Um, but the idea was to do a pilot study and to just start to, you know, at least present this concept that functional medicine operates in a holistic system and that, you know, um, it'd be really great if we could figure out how to look at this uh, whole issue of getting people healthy from a, a broader perspective. So, um, if you're interested in a copy of the study, just email the office. We'll send you out a copy. And you can take a look at it. And there's a lot more information that goes along with this. You know, there was literally hundreds of pages of documents that we put together. 
But um, in, in regards to the adrenal programs, I want to just show you real quick. You know, we used um, uh, this classic adrenal protocol that I've been doing for 25 years, DHEA, pregnenolone, vitamins, minerals, etc., and got some really good results. And I also want to kind of give you a historical conf context, too, because I've been looking back through all my paperwork because we're cleaning up my server at work and getting organized, you know, and um, I found this document that I wrote in 1999. How crazy is that? Uh, this I wrote this actually in 98. It was printed in 99. This was the year my son was born. And so what I came up with back in those days was this idea of a foundational health program, and I wrote this book on the three pillars of health, hormones, GI, and detox. And, you know, if I read through this the other day, and it's 20 years later almost, and um, and then I combine that, if you combine that experience with what I've done recently in the last couple of years, is that I've started hitting all the seminars again. I'm going to every potential seminar I can in our area of integrative medicine and really looking to see how things have changed and so excited to see all the new research coming out, all the new practitioners. And then I go back and I read this thing from 20 years ago. I'm like, wow, this is exactly the same stuff. Things really, they've changed so much and yet they haven't changed at all. If anything, things are just getting to be more like they were back in these days. People are more catabolic, have more digestive problems. We're seeing more severe problems that you know we didn't even used to encounter in practice. So, you know, I just want to always think about this in a historical context because I think it's important on a lot of different levels. Number one is because the people that taught me this work, you know, I want to acknowledge them. Dr. Timmons was my primary teacher in the adrenal gland work, and prior to that, I worked with a fellow named Dr. Michael Leibowitz, who's who's still alive and still teaches. So I learned a lot, of, and and there's another fellow, all you chiropractors know, Wally Schmidt, um, and you know the AK doctors like Schmidt and Leibowitz. Um, you know, really got me thinking about endocrine systems, and I spent maybe three, four years working with them. Then I met Dr. Timmons, and I started to learn about functional medicine. I was like, whoa, you can do lab tests for this. Who would have thought? Muscle testing, lab testing, I clearly went in the direction of the lab work. Not because I think muscle testing is bad or wrong in any way. Um, I just like the labs more, uh, to be honest. I just like the lab testing more. And so I became fascinated with this. And I have now, you know, back in, the, back in 1998, 99, I was doing technical support for a lab uh, company, BioHealth, I and mean, I had about 500 doctors that I was managing. And I had, if you can, if you're this old enough to remember, I had a cell phone. You know, they were pretty new in those days. I had a pager, and I had my landline. And I remember one time being in my home office, and I was on the landline talking to a doctor going over a case. My pager went off and my cell phone rang with two other doctors. I mean, I was busy. I was really working hard uh, to understand how these adrenal programs work and to teach people how to implement them. And so the culmination of all these years of work really was in this study. Um, who would have thought, you know, 20 years ago that, you know, Dan Kalish would publish a study on anything, let alone with, you know, two people that work at the Mayo Clinic. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal you know, arc that we've come on, and I'm not talking about me individually, I'm talking about our profession and the acceptance of this work and all this good stuff. And um, when I think about what we actually do as clinicians with patients, I work, oh sorry, I work on the, I do the exact same things now, like literally to the drop, to the milligram, the exact same protocols that I was taught 20 years ago, that hasn't changed at all. So I just want to emphasize that. It hasn't changed at all. I mean, there's some minor tweaks and minor improvements, but what's really come a long way, I think, is the social acceptance of this movement that we're leading in, in functional medicine. And so I want to look now, you know, today at this historical context and think about all these years and all these tests and try to share with you the basic take-home messages that I have learned so you can apply this in your own practices. All right, and we're going to skip around with these slides a little bit. These slides were created by Dr. Mark Newman, who's the director of uh, the Dutch lab company called Precision Analytical Labs. So they're not mine. Um, just want to acknowledge Mark for helping giving these to me. And I want to look at, I'm going to skip around a little bit because I have a plan here, but I want to show you, just let me talk you through it a little bit. So, so back in the day, you know, 
we had this concept that the adrenals were a problem, you know, and the doctors, you know, like Wally Schmidt and those guys long, you know, knew about this, and the, they were all over this in the 1960s, easily. And, you know, everyone was struggling with this adrenal concept, and I can remember, you know, reading in chiropractic college, Wally Schmidt's endocrinology book, and just, not just reading it, but reading it and reading it again and reading it again, I'm like, whoa, thyroid, whoa, adrenals, how does all this work, you know? And, and, and a large groups of naturopaths and chiropractors and the early adopted, early adopter medical doctors are trying to figure out what really happens to the adrenal glands and how does the endocrine system overall completely fall apart? What's that all about? And so when I came on the scene, 1992, I come on the scene and I'm like reading every book, going to every seminar like literally every single weekend for many, many years in a row, I was at a seminar in the front row, listening, taking notes, trying to figure all this stuff out. And um, I was that, that obsessive compulsive student that you hate, the one in the front that's always asking questions, that was me, okay? And um, what, what I gleaned from that was that this adrenal issue was really big and really important, and that it was something that doctors needed to learn about and that the way it was being taught at that time to me was really frustrating because it was complicated. And there's a reason why I had to go to every seminar and travel all around because it was just not put together in a clear, easy to integrate system. And I've spent most of my career trying to create clear integrated systems. And when I look back in 1998, 99, I was doing it back then, you know, um, the year my son was born. So I just want to give you some ideas, again, historical context here. This is a chart that a lab company called Diagnostex uses. Um, many of you know Diagnostics. They run what's called the ASI test, and they're a company out of Washington State. Um, uh, my teacher, uh, my, my, my main teacher on the adrenal is Dr. Timmons, who came after, you know, he taught me about the lab work. I already knew a lot about this from Wally Schmidt and all the endocrine guys in AK. Um, so I was like primed on adrenals, but Dr. Tim has taught me everything I know about the lab work for sure. Um, when 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 uh, Timmons was a younger man, uh, before I met him, he teamed up with his fellow Dr. Ilias, and um, Timmons did all the technical support, traveled around, did all the lectures and seminars, and Dr. Ilias ran the lab. Again, the lab was called Diagnostics, and they still exist today, although both of these men uh, very tragically are dead, so they're not around to tell the story, which is why I'm trying to tell the story. Um, and you got to understand when someone like when, when someone like Ilias and Timmons were were talking together, it would be like two ten-year-old kids at a football game with hot dogs and ice cream and popcorn, having like the best time of their life because they're at like the you know the NFL championship Super Bowl game or something. Right? These guys were really excited, and what fired them up was lab work. Go figure. I mean, I was just a wallflower in those years, just trying to soak all this stuff up. And so what they did, understandably, was try to design models that were relatively accurate. And, you know, this was one of the early models, was that there are these cortisol DHEA correlation zones. And over here on this axis, we see cortisol. And on this axis, we see DHEA. And the concept here is that as we're stressed, we all know cortisol goes up. So we would go up in that direction. And what you don't always think about is as you get stressed, DHEA goes up also. So DHEA would go up in that direction. Which means that if you're way up here, it means your cortisol and your DHEA are up and you're stressed out of your mind and they call that adapted to stress. So in other words, high cortisol, high DHEA is a healthy person that has a lot of stress but hasn't burned out yet. And then in this model, as you can see, there's seven zones correlation zones, they call them, because over time we all know cortisol drops, eventually DHEA starts to plummet, and then bad things start to happen, people get sick, and along the way, of course, inevitably the thyroid gets dragged along with this and the whole thing falls apart. Um, and then what most people don't know, but it's worth mentioning, and, and uh, these fellows discovered this again, I don't know, every, these guys knew all this stuff before I came to the scene, so this is like 30 to 40 years ago this was discovered, that DHEA can also go up at the end of the adrenal burnout process before it drops down again and everything completely collapses. So there's this final surge or last gasp of DHEA that you sometimes see on labs where it doesn't make sense, like, wow, that cortisol is so low, but the DHEA is surging. Well, that would be what in this system they called a zone six. Now, some of the systems that were taught when I was learning this work were 
this is a relatively simplified version. We're even more complicated than this because if you really want to look at what's happening to the HPA axis, it's mind-numbingly complex. And so there was one night, kind of late, 11, 11.30, I'm at Dr. Timmons' house and we always did these late night conferences because I would do a whole day of patients, grab my patient charts, drive down to his house and we would just get some tacos. We always went to the same Mexican restaurant, I don't know why. We always go to this Mexican place, get tacos, fish tacos, and then go over my charts and then go back to his house and then go over my charts and he would just stick with me until they were all done. And every week I had to catch up on every patient because he was you know, basically training me how to do this work. And one of those nights we had a seminar coming up where I was starting to kind of edge into the teaching. He's like, you know, he would put me on like the hour after lunch when no one wants to talk and I'd do a little talk about the adrenals and, you know, he would handle 90% of the heavy lifting, but he was, you know, prepping me. I didn't understand this at the time. He was prepping me, getting me ready, throwing me out there for an hour at a time so I could talk in front of groups of like 100 doctors. So we're getting ready for one of these adrenal seminars and I'm like, Bill, you know, this is so complicated. And because I had been hanging around for long enough, I understood what he was trying to say. But then again, I was studying with this guy on a regular basis, like every day, and meeting with him in person a couple times a week. So I kind of got what he was trying to say. But I, I, and I tried to politely say, you know, Bill, I didn't say it in this way, but I basically implied no one really understands what you're saying. And when they leave the seminars, they're just a little confused. And so what I said was, could we just present this in a really simple form? Like, what's the simplest form that we could try to teach this in, where doctors can learn a protocol that they can implement to help the adrenals? And, and I always like three, I like numbers three, right? Three body systems, three reasons why the adrenals burn out, three body systems are neuroendocrine, GI, and detox. Three reasons why the adrenals burn out, emotional, dietary, and inflammatory stress. So I always come up with things in threes, which is a precursor to me becoming a Taoist, but that's another story. So I'm like, can we just come up with three of these? And he's like, yeah, we could come up with, well, the three would be, well, high cortisol's high, uh, what else? Oh, cortisol's dropping, and then cortisol's low. I'm great, let's just use those three stages. And that's how this three-stage thing started in the seminars that we were teaching. And so it was a massive, massive oversimplification of what we understand. Even this chart on the board right now is a massive oversimplification. But I always wanted us to teach in the language that we could explain this to patients in. Okay, so that's one sort of warm-up historical note. And the whole concept that we called it adrenal fatigue is for patient communication purposes. Always we've known and this was the central tenet of the work that we were doing at the time, was that what was really happening was that the HPA axis was in this complete disarray, okay? Just absolutely complete disarray. And that the hypothalamus and the pituitary were no longer sending normal signals to the adrenal cortex and that the system was just basically crashing. And that the goal then, and this is the challenge Dr. Timmons put to me, this is a challenge he put to himself, was how can we restore, this is really an important concept, how can we restore normal HPA axis function with a, with a supplement program and lifestyle changes? Not how can we make people feel better, not how can we make the labs look better while people are taking stuff, how can we actually get the internal production to come back online? And if you look at the research study carefully, when we did the testing, we did initial adrenal panels on all the patients. We did a six-month program. We stopped for a few weeks, and we retested when they were taking nothing. And the idea here is to see how close can we get to resetting the adrenal axis. We're trying to fix this problem, not just temporarily improve it. And I've devoted the last 20-plus years of my life to trying to figure that out. And I'll tell you, I know a lot less now than I knew 20 years ago, but um, I've seen tens of thousands of these various labs, and I'm really like... Um, my brain has just become a repository of information from this, which is why I do the seminars, because I want to get all this stuff out so I can go to move to Hawaii and start an organic farm or I don't know, do something else with my life. But I want to get everything in my head out first uh, uh, into your head so you all can do this work and you can come visit me at my organic farm. Not about to do that, but you know, one of these years it's going to have to happen. So let's, let's look here as a copy of the study. So now want to think about the lab testing and how it's starting to evolve and change and how this all relates back to the testing that's been done for a long time. So um, free, saliva, free cortisol testing has been done in saliva for decades. It predates, far predates the use of uh, the integrative doctors using this technology. It's been around for a really long time. And 
it's accurate, it's consistent, there's lab laboratories all throughout the, the world that have been doing this at major research institutions from Harvard on down and so um, even though the salivary uh, cortisol testing maybe is not so accepted in conventional medical circles, if you walked into the biological anthropology department at Harvard and talked to you know any of the professors there they'd be of course yeah we use salivary cortisol testing because you know if they're doing a, a research study in the middle of Central America or Africa or something like that it's really easy to get salivary samples and freeze them and pretty challenging to get blood samples and handle that right so something that's been around for a really long time it's really well established and we understand that it works well and now what's happening is there's a new technology and I feel like as clinicians a couple of things one is that we should know about the things that are new that are coming in we should do them evaluate them, see how they compare, if they're better or worse than the things that we've been using, and then, you know, reshuffle the deck. I mean, as another example of this, when, when I first started testing for H. pylori, you know, 25 years ago, there wasn't much available, so there was a highly inaccurate test that no one really trusted. There was the standard blood antibodies and um, a breath test. You know? So I just resorted to doing what everyone else was doing at the time. We just did blood antibodies for H. pylori for years. And then this new technology came on the market. It was a, a, a stool antigen test with H. pylori. And I was like, well, that's kind of strange. How accurate is that? What do I know about that? You know? And I ran, this is how crazy I am, I ran side-by-side -side blood and stool antibodies for H. pylori for like at least five years, at least. Maybe four, four to five years. I just didn't trust the new technology. I was just like, oh, I don't know if this is right or not. And then eventually I realized after looking at hundreds of tests that, you know, the new technology was actually working pretty well. And so I find, and there's a lot of new technology coming on the market now across the board in functional medicine. There's things like uh, PCR DNA stool testing. There's things like the Dutch test like we're doing tonight. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, it's kind of incumbent on us to check these things out you know, build up opinions about them, but also have your roots in the history and, and focus of the, uh, the work that we know is really good. And so let's take a look here and I'll show you. I want to show you some examples of some of the things that we can do here. And I always, I don't know, I'm such a clinician, I hate these slides, I just want to look at the actual test itself. So for, when you're looking at any kind of an adrenal panel, and this includes, uh, salivary and the Dutch testing as well. I just want to show you a few basic things and we'll, we'll come back and talk about the Dutch testing in a minute but let me just get a, a sample lab up here first. Here we go, that's a good one. All right, so there's two things that you really want to consider. One is the actual production of the hormones and we'll talk about this in detail you know um, tonight. They're in the usual salivary testing, we're looking at free cortisol. In the newer type of testing with the Dutch test, they're also looking at free cortisol as well as uh, metabolized cortisol. Right? So there's two different ways of analyzing this. Um, and you want to see whether you're using a salivary or a Dutch test, what is the amount of cortisol that the person is producing? And at the same time, equally important, some people would probably argue more important, is what's actually happening with the rhythm of production? Is it up and down? Is it flat? Is it up? <laughs> is it just down? You know, what's happening with the actual rhythm? And all, all these years and all these tests later, I have found that I can look at a salivary or for that matter a Dutch adrenal test, see what the rhythm or the pattern is, and it's to me it's like an x-ray into the, the brain, the hypothalamus, uh, the emotional state, uh, uh, the eating habits of that particular patient. I just to see them because I've seen so many of these tests. And the way that I've taught myself this after all those years of interning and all those years of training with Dr. Timmons was the real, the real education for me has been lab test is in front of me, patient's in front of me, I'm talking to patient, is the lab make sense or how can I make sense of the lab based on the patient. And that's been the bulk of my of my education, you know, and so I want to try to communicate some of these basic principles tonight, so you guys get a sense of how all this works. So again, you want to think about production amounts, whether it's salivary or the newer Dutch testing, and you want to think about the rhythm or patterns. Those are the two big variables, and obviously you want to correct to each of these. So if the cortisol levels are high, 
regardless of what kind of test it is, you want to bring them down. If the rhythm is out of balance, regardless of what kind of test it is, you want to normalize the rhythm. That's our main goal here. And if you can get even a slight improvement in the rhythm, the patient's going to feel quite a bit better. They're going to do better with all the other protocols that you might want to use. If you can get an improvement in the production, the patient's going to feel a lot better. Okay, this stuff really works. You don't have to worry about the part uh, about whether it works or not. Now, if you just have some free time and you can't think of anything better to do with yourself than read a book, I would highly, highly recommend reading this. It's by Tom Gilliams, PhD. It is, the title of it is The Role of Stress in the HPA Axis in Chronic Disease Management. And it's a wonderful, updated version of all things to do with the adrenal glands, latest research, latest findings. And Tom's a really wonderful writer, and he's kind of given us, again, a historical context. So it's not just about oh, this new research study. It is the whole story of the adrenals and what we know now and how that changes the way that we looked at a lot of information from the past. Okay? What you're treating, is it HPA, what's driving all this? So that's an important one too. So let's let's take a look now at some of the details on this actual test here. I'm going to back it up a little bit. And I'll give you a few examples. Let's just look at the actual lab. That's so much easier. So I, you know, and people ask, and this is a hard question to answer, you know, people ask, you know, well, what do you think is better? Is the Dutch test better or is the salary test better? That to me is like asking, do you like your 1971 Alfa Romeo more or the one that you just sold? Which is, I'm going to just take a little commercial break here to promote the, the brand Alfa Romeo. So there's the Alfa, there's the 1971 Alfa Romeo. It's a beautiful car. I mean, it's got a 1750 motor. It just hauls ass. If it's really old, obviously it's like 50 years old, but it's just a beautiful classic car. And I, I don't even know. It just brings tears to my eyes just actually looking at this thing. You know, I just love, love, love this car. I love it. Um, and then if you want to look at my other Alfa Romeo that I got rid of, which is kind of funny. I'll show you here. Oh my God, this car is beautiful too. Ha! <laughs> that's my car, you guys. I owned this car for like two years. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually the vehicle that I owned. It's just a really great photograph. Is that beautiful? Oh my God, that is sexy. All carbon fiber. That thing was so fast. I almost died in that car like three or four times. Oh my God. It just, it was a launch edition. It was like the second or third one of these cars they shipped to the United States and I bought it. This is my 50-year-old present to myself. Ah, uh, do you want that car? You want that car? I don't know. You know? So you can't really choose. It's not like one of these is better. There's certain patients that are going to be better contextually, I think, for each one of these tests. There's price point related issues. There's, do you want to go with newer technology or older technology? But we should know about all these things, right? So that's why I'm doing this class. And you can make your own opinions up once you've done a bunch of these tests and see. So um, I'm going to show you some examples about how this actually works and some bigger picture issues with the adrenals as well. So we're not you know, so compressed in just thinking about uh, this isolated thing. Because in functional medicine, we tend to like boil things down a little too much sometimes. And I, let me give you a little more contextual stuff here, because I think this is super important. Here it is. So the things that I'm learning now um, in my practice, having, you know, just a, again, a little history. So I had those years of doing AK and muscle testing and all that stuff. I had a good 10-year stretch, hmm, 10, 12 years of just obsessively focusing on, uh, focusing on salivary adrenal labs. That's all I did. And GI and organic acids, but, you know, um, I really just focused on that. And then I spent about another 12, 13 years um, obsessively focusing on catecholamines in the brain and serotonin related things. And in my practice now, I'm trying to put all these things together. My background and understanding of adrenal hormone production, the little bit that I know about the thyroid, and not a thyroid expert, although I do work with thyroid a little bit, and then how the catecholamines all play into this. And so this is really important because with our patients, you're going to want to try to figure these things out. 
So on the on the right hand side of the screen here, where I'm circling, we have the cortisol side of all this, and we've got hormones being produced in the adrenal cortex, hence the name cortisol, meaning the cortex. And on the opposite side, we have the adrenal medulla. The inside of the adrenal glands, the medulla, where we make our catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and also dopamine is made there. So we've got Hormone gland, hormone, you know, hormone glands producing these uh, glucocorticosteroids in the cortex, and then we've got the inner medulla producing the catecholamines. Now, of course, the catecholamines are also produced in your brain, aren't they? As a matter of fact, that's kind of where we think of them coming from, as well. Adrenaline or noradrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine. So adrenaline, ad, it means above. Renal is kidney, so above the kidneys, that's where the adrenal glands are located. Epi, epinephrine, epi above, nephrine again, nephrology, the kidneys, yeah. So whether it's the Greek or the Latin, I like to use the adrenaline term because everyone has heard that before. Adrenaline rush, people are familiar with that. So we get this adrenaline rush when our adrenals are under stress, it's catecholamines, but there's also a major significant issue happening in the brain with these chemicals on the catecholamine side. And then on the cortisol side, of course, there's no cortisol produced in your brain. That's just being produced in the adrenal cortex. So you have these two competing interests when we're stressed. You've got surges of cortisol and surges of catecholamines. The catecholamines coming from the adrenal glands, but that also is going to impact the catecholamines that are produced in your brain. You have to keep all that in mind. And I think with each patient now, I'm trying to decide Am I going to go down this cortisol pathway and work primarily with adrenal hormones, like we're talking about tonight, or am I going to work primarily on the catecholamine connection and work with the adrenal medulla and the brain in terms of catecholamine production? And energy problems, depression problems, mood disorders can be corrected either way. There may be some patients where you want to do both cortisol balancing and catecholamine balancing together. In which case you'd want to do, um, you know, the organic acids testing and all that good stuff too. So keep that in mind as we look at all this too. Now let's look at some of the detail now about uh, the specifics on a Dutch test. So here, let me slip through these here. So we talked about that. We can come back to that later, but let me show you here. So, you know, usually the, the cortisol testing that I've done all these years, we do salivary testing four times a day. We get cortisol and a couple of DHEAs. This new technology is done from a urine sample. Okay. And the lab is looking at free cortisol, as we are with the salivary, which is a certain percent, a small percentage of the total production. And it's also looking at the cortisol metabolites. And so that's probably the biggest difference here, is that it's measuring the breakdown products of cortisol as well as measuring the cortisol itself, so you get more information. And it's different, the total circulating cortisol and the free cortisol are going to be numbers that are different, and then the question here is do you need both? I mean to a certain extent more information is always better, but then to a certain extent you may not need the information because of the extra cost or because of the complexity of interpreting the lab. And these labs are pretty complicated to interpret. So in general, what um, we can learn about, and I'm going to show you a test here, is in addition to the free cortisol and all that that, that would show us, right, we can also learn about um, cortisol clearance with the Dutch test. So in other words, you can see the not only the amount of cortisol that's circulating and free, but how the cortisol is being cleared. And that can be a helpful piece of information. So cortisol clearance can be abnormal if there's thyroid problems, if there's obesity, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And of course, obviously, if your liver is not working real well, then your cortisol is not going to get cleared real well. Now, here's a good example of a Dutch test that shows you something that's like, hmm, I wonder what that means. Yeah, let's take a look here. If you look at the usual measure that we look at, and here's our free cortisol here, it's a biologically active form that would match what we would see on salivary, it's quite high. But at the same time, when we look at the metabolized cortisol, and that's all the metabolites added together, that number is actually really low. So that implies that the body is not clearing the free cortisol very effectively and it's building up. 
Okay, so that's another data point that you have that you wouldn't have got from the salivary testing. And that can imply that there's a thyroid problem. And that may make you want to go and either look at thyroid protocols or think about thyroid testing for that individual patient. Now, again, when we're looking at the rhythms here that are so important, here's a patient's values here. And we're seeing a high cortisol, high cortisol, a big cortisol crash, and then the cortisol coming back to normal. So the rhythm patterns, as I mentioned earlier, can be more important than the total production issue. I'm going to say that again. The pattern with the rhythm of cortisol production, free cortisol, whether it's salivary or urinary, can be more important than the amount of cortisol that they're actually producing. And my general experience working with patients has been very clear, which is that people experience the rhythm. When they say they're tired, you're going to see that in the rhythm. When they say they're hungry, you're going to see that in the rhythm. When they say they can't sleep, you're going to see that in the rhythm. So people perceive, and that makes sense, this is the free cortisol that's actually biologically active that's going in and out of cells. So you're going to capture free cortisol on salivary or you're going to capture it on the Dutch test either way. And that is, you know, from a patient-centric point of view, probably the most important thing because that's what people experience. And we're not trying to abstractly heal the adrenal glands so that the adrenal gland committee of the world is happier, right? We're trying to like fix people's problems and make them feel better. That's really the whole point of this job. And so when you see a high free cortisol, you want to knock it down. And you can use phosphorine to do that. It's incredibly effective. When you see cortisol dropping, if there was a low one, you want to bring it up. And I use licorice root drops, extract of licorice root, to bring the cortisol back up. And so we're constantly trying to adjust cortisols that are high down, cortisols that are low back up to reset this rhythm. And that makes people feel better. And then we layer on top of that a certain amount of DHEA and pregnenolone to help trick, in essence, the HPA axis into seeing normal circulating levels of hormones so the cycling starts to come back. At least that's the theory anyways. And that was the theory that I was taught. You know, honestly, I don't know if it's true or not. I don't think anyone does because how many studies have there been on this? Like, you know, none really that actually measure, you know, what's happening at such a detailed level. But we know that the protocols work. And I think a lot of times in functional medicine, we just do things that we know work and then we explain them after the fact. And maybe the science someday will kind of show us something different. But the basics are, are I don't think, I, I think are undisputable. We want to lower high cortisol. Phosphorine does that. If there was a low cortisol here, we want to bring it back up. Okay, so that's the story for free cortisol. It's the rhythm. We want to reset that. It makes people feel better. Super important. Now, metabolized cortisol, and in this particular case, remember, the free cortisol is high, but the metabolized cortisol is low. So the metabolized cortisol is the breakdown products of cortisol, calling that total cortisol production. So that's giving you an idea into the adrenal glands, win, the, a window into the adrenal glands, the actual production of cortisol, if you forget about the free levels, actually in this patient seems to be low, and that's pointing towards a clearance problem. Okay, they're not making enough cortisol in total, but the free is building up. That could be a clearance problem that you'd want to address. So that's a nice information to know. Okay. This lab also includes cortisone as well as cortisol, so you get some more information there. You can get general indications as to inflammation and emotional stress, looking at those kinds of markers also. And then you can also have increased clearance, which makes sense when you think about it, and that would be the opposite, and we see this a lot in obesity. So in obesity, when people are overweight, free cortisol more likely to go down than up, and of course we've all seen that pattern a million times, and it looks like what I would call stage three. I describe that to patients as a broken metabolism. Cortisol is low, it's a fat burning hormone, you're not able to burn fat efficiently because your cortisol is messed up. But, however, in obesity, even though the free cortisol tends to drop, sometimes the metabolized cortisol can go up. Okay? So you might have a different treatment strategy to a certain extent based on the reality that the free is low, but the total is up. And there's a fat person. That doesn't look very good, does it? <laughs> 
I hate pictures of people who are overweight. I, I don't know. It just kind of disturbs me. Uh, maybe I have like my own body image issues or something. So common results in obese patients, right? The free cortisol is very low. And again, I would describe this as a broken, metabolo broken metabolism. But the metabolized cortisol is up. Now, what's interesting about this to me is that the protocols that were developed based on the salivary testing, by and large, 99% of the time seem to hold valid for the Dutch testing as well. Okay, so with someone with low cortisol, we want to bring the free cortisol levels back up. And for that, we use pregnenolone, DHEA, all these different protocols to organize that and get that to come back up. And of course, with obese patients, you also have to focus, obviously, on the diet, because these cortisol programs are not that effective if they're just being done um, without, you know, all the lifestyle changes. So remember, we're not trying to treat the adrenals directly. We're not even treating adrenal fatigue. That term was just made up as a way for patients to understand what was happening, so that's something to talk about with your patients. What we're really trying to do is reset the HPA axis. Okay, we're trying to, in this patient's case, the last one was high, this one's low, we're trying to bring that cortisol up into the normal range. And in this case, without overstimulating this over here, because that's already elevated. Okay, does that make sense? That's kind of the goal. We're trying to bring up the ones that are low and knock down the ones that are high. And it turns out, you know, one of the most effective tools for doing this is pregnenolone. Pregnenolone is not really used that much. I think the interest in pregnenolone just kind of faded. You don't really hear people running around talking about how great pregnenolone is. It's, it's, um, it's always been like the number two, number three seller in my clinic. I mean, I'll go through more pregnenolone than anything else. And, you know, one of the things that I realized couple years ago is regardless of what I prescribe and what I tell patients to take, this is kind of sad but true, no matter how hard we try to email them or tell them to do follow-up consults, people just buy the stuff that makes them feel better more than they buy the other stuff. And you know, once a patient's worked with me for a while, you know, they're just gonna, there's no way you can control people, right? You can't force them to do things. And pregnenolone, hands down, um, and it, I'll, I'll tell you my top sellers in my clinic in general, Sac Pilardi, that we can't even keep that on the shelves, it sells like crazy. Um, uh, mitochondrial energy support and pregnenolone, those are the three. Now we would probably sell just as much DHEA, but, but the dosing that I use is so much lower, so one DHEA bottle lasts, you know, like a couple months, whereas people go through pregnenolone pretty high because the dosing patterns are higher. So pregnenolone and DHEA. So remember, just think about this, that what we're trying to do really is treat the HPA axis, where these are brain treatments primarily, they're not actually treatments for the adrenal glands. They're treatments for the brain's control of the adrenal glands, and we're trying to figure out is there high or low cortisol and start to manipulate that back into its normal balance. Now, some of the basic principles here include things like blood sugar control. And I think when, when I had um, finished my basic education in clinical nutrition and was first starting to learn about functional medicine, what shocked me the most was how much importance had to be placed on blood sugar control. And that for many of my chronic patients, if we don't get control over blood sugar, none of these things happen. We don't get, obviously, insulin or cortisol balance. The thyroid's always going to be off. They're going to be eating the wrong foods constantly, and you just completely lose control over the patient. And so, I've always been kind of fascinated by blood sugar control and what makes that work. And there's obvious, you know, every, couple, every supplement company that we work with has, you know, uh, you know, some blood sugar control product, whatever the name of that may be. It's always got gluco in it, gluco well, gluco balance, gluco plus, gluco whatever. Um, but, and, I mean, those are kind of the obvious things. But in addition to that, you know, what, what's really happening in terms of blood sugar control, in terms of macronutrient ratios. Because this is something we have to coach every single patient on, isn't it? You know, how much protein, fat, and carbohydrates should you eat with every meal to keep your blood sugar rock solid? And I'll tell you the, um, the challenges of that question I, I couldn't even begin to approach. Because you think it would be pretty simple and there'd be one formula, but absolutely, absolutely not the case that we could just come up with 
a single fixed diet for every single patient that's going to stabilize their blood sugar. And so I just want to talk about this briefly because I think it's pretty important when we're doing adrenal programs because you don't figure this out, they're not going to get well. So we have one group of patients um, who I think of as like classical functional medicine patients. And who are they? They have Lyme disease. They have mold exposure. They have lupus, Hashimoto's, or some other autoimmune problem. They have chronic fatigue. They have uh, multiple co-infections of some kind. They have heavy metal toxicity or heavy metal poisoning. They have chemical toxicity or chemical poisoning. Um, they have cognitive destruction from some, you know, uh, head trauma or something like that. These are the, the, the sort of uh, bread and butter of all functional medicine practices. In general, they do horribly within conventional medicine. They don't respond well to those treatments. So they come over to our side and they're kind of forced to deal with people like us because conventional medicine has no solutions for them whatsoever. It usually makes them worse. So that's one pretty big cohort of patients. And out of that group of patients, there's a subset of them who, a pretty big subset, who have horrible GI problems, as you all know. Whether it's diagnosed as Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, IBD, IBB, IBB, PP, whatever, unless you don't want to get to it, right? Their gut is completely inflamed and damaged, and they have a pretty major problem going on with food. And so for those patients, what do we have? We have SCD diets, GAPS diets, low histamine diets, FODMAPS diets, the autoimmune paleo diet. You know, it just goes on and on because doctors over the years have had to scramble to figure out, oh, crap, this person's reacting to everything. Um, you know, I'm going to pull out gluten. Or this person's reacting to everything and pull out dairy or soy or, you know, add meat or eliminate meat or whatever it is that we have to do with these people that have chronic GI issues that can't eat normally. And that, to me, that dialogue around diet and FODMAPs, GAPs, SCD, gluten-free, all those things, has kind of dominated um, the functional medicine landscape. Necessarily so, because you've got to figure out what a patient can eat. So that's one, some, one kind of subset of people. Now, for that group of people, in general, in my experience, they need to eat animal products. Oftentimes, they're completely intolerant to grains. Sometimes they can't even eat vegetables without getting sick. And so you don't have a whole lot of choices. Someone gets sick from fruit and a lot of vegetables and can't eat grains. You know, you're kind of stuck using animal products. And so for that group of patients, I try to, you know, we all try to create blood sugar control programs and diets that have a, you know, a major component of animal protein in them. And that's how I learned how to do this, and I did this for many years quite successfully. You know, three to five ounces of animal protein with each meal, healthy fats, the coconut oil, the olive oil, all that kind of stuff, and limited grains, make sure they're gluten-free, no fruit, maybe some vegetables, maybe a lot of vegetables depending on the patient and how reactive they are to veggies and how well they can digest them. So that's kind of one camp. And then there's another camp, you know, which has usually, at least in my experience, they're not, they don't dominate the functional medicine landscape as much, but these would be patients with cardiovascular disease, could be like high blood pressure, they're at risk for a stroke or had a stroke or a risk for a heart attack or had a heart attack. Uh, could be diabetics. They're either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Um, let's see what else. Uh, could be someone who uh, is simply overweight but otherwise is not in a you know, health crisis. They don't have an autoimmune condition. They're just overweight. So in this subset of patients, you know, blood sugar control can look a lot different. And this is something that I'm, I'm really seeing clearly now. And so in this other subset of patients, um, they can handle all vegetables. They can eat all grains as long as the grains are gluten-free. And they don't react poorly to grains. They can eat beans. They can eat potatoes. They can eat all the vegetables. They can eat all the fruit. And they actually are really healthy foods for these people. And those are the folks that if I give them too many animal products, too much animal fat, it actually doesn't help the blood sugar control any more than if we mix animal protein and animal fat. Okay, so again, I was trained and learned on the patients that require animal fat, animal protein in order to survive, but what I'm seeing now in my practice much more are people who I can put on what we would call a plant-based diet or vegetarian diet and have them be actually more successful by eliminating meat then it would be with another group who, if you eliminate meat in the chronically fatigued type folks, you know, they would get very sick. So it's interesting. I'm seeing this pretty big dichotomy in my practice now. And um, I just want to point that out. In my sick patients with GI problems, if I used a plant-based diet, they would have nothing to eat. 
right? Because they can't do grains and sometimes they can't do vegetables at all. So it's just sort of a, a discussion point. But as I'm seeing, as people uh, come in with these other conditions, I'm having a lot of really great success with plant-based diets in some of these folks. And the interesting thing to me is that I would have thought that plant-based diets would absolutely destroy people's blood sugar. And plant-based diets will destroy people's blood sugar if they're not eating properly, if they're eating an unhealthy plant-based diet, then they can really go bad pretty fast. Um, so anyways, this is something to think about and play around with as you're starting to think about blood sugar control. And that's an essential component in creating a balance in the adrenal glands. And there'll be some people you can get away with plant-based diets with and others who you can't. We also want to limit inflammation. And so that's kind of a call out to the GI tract and the liver, whether there's gut infections, or liver toxicity, we want to you know, resolve that. Um, correcting for problems related to sleep and rest. The neurotransmitters we talked about earlier in terms of catecholamines. DHEA and pregnenolone supplementation. Now there's some cases where you can't use DHEA or pregnenolone. What if they have a hormone related uh, breast cancer or a hormone related uh, uterine cancer, then you know hormones are probably contraindicated, so you can't always use pregnenolone. What if it's a 12-year-old kid? You definitely don't want to use hormones. So sometimes you have to wonder about hormones. Oftentimes we use them. Also using phosphatidylserine to lower cortisol. I don't use glandulars in my practice, but a lot of patients love them. I don't have any problem with glandulars. Go for it if you like them and they make people feel better. I think they're great. And then I do use a lot of adaptogenic herbs okay, to, to get all that figured out. All right, let's see. Let's take a look at a couple things, and then I'll show you a case or two if we have time. Okay. Um, oh, this is our interested in learning more slide, apparently. So hands down, we have just a wonderful program. If you're thinking about joining, this is a great time to do it. It's a great group of people. It's a great class. It's a great model. We're also, or I'm also going to start teaching a practice management component to the class. I think we're going to release that in November. So if you don't want to take the whole clinical training and you just want to spend time and money focusing on practice management, we're going to be doing that. And that class is going to be around uh, $2,500 to $3,000, somewhere in that range, just for practice management. Pretty exciting about that. We've actually been teaching the practice management within the whole training program. We're going to break it out now because a lot of people have asked to just do practice management as a course, so we'll have that available. We have the lecture hall with all the materials there. We have our online community, which is really active. Our next group starts in September, if you're interested. Um, we have a whole huge curriculum going on around organic acids as well as all these other things to do with... Uh, adrenal hormones, whatnot. We have now, at this point in the, in the development of this training program, we have 2,000 case studies. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. You know, that's more, basically we have more stuff in here than you could ever read or digest. Let me just show you how it all works so you can see real quick. Because once you join in the class, you get access to the community. And the, in the community, you can ask questions and talk to other doctors. But we also have the database here, right? So let's say you type in, uh, adrenals or something like that. Okay, it'll pop up with all the discussions around adrenal glands and all the case studies that have to do with the adrenals. And then everything is recorded and transcribed. So every single case study, and there's a couple thousand of them, is got a video component and a transcription component so you can just read and listen as long as you want. And if you wanted to know about something like uh, H. pylori, you just type that into the search engine, and you'll see every case that we've discussed about H. pylori coming up. H. pylori in a vegan, H. pylori with Parkinson's, H. pylori with who knows what, just a million different things, articles, case studies, it just goes on and on. Oh my gosh, look at that. I would say that's more than you could probably read or listen to on pretty much any subject. Um, I feel really proud to have developed this in collaboration with all the students that have been studying hard and contributing to the community, we've really built up quite something here. Okay? So we have that, and then of course we have the course materials and lectures as well, and um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have a separate practice management class that's going to be starting uh, probably around November, if you're interested in just doing that kind of work with me. All right? So quick summary of thoughts on all this. Yeah, we have I mean, a historical context, which I think is really important. We want to think about um, 
how you're treating patients, if you see high cortisols on any of these types of labs, knock them down, use the phosphorine, use the DHEA and pregnenolone, get things down and under control. Um, if you see low cortisol on any of these patients, bring the cortisols back up, use the licorice root or other adaptogenic herbs that you may like, get that issue sorted out. Always, always, always with everyone, talk about blood sugar, figure out are they on the paleo autoimmune diet? Are they on a whole foods plant-based diet? What is going to be the diet for that individual that really dials in their blood sugar? And you know, I have personally been on uh, paleo diets for many years. I am personally uh, have also been on plant-based diets for many years. And I feel different ways depending on the diet. I'm, I don't have a lot of chronic health problems, so I'm pretty healthy and fortunate that way. But I don't have like a personal bias like every one of my patients has to eat this way. And in fact, I've ate every different way you can imagine. Uh, for many years at a time, and I don't have a, a really strong bias or preference on that, but I do try to figure out what's the appropriate diet for each individual patient. And um, I think that's really key. You know, if you're working with the chronically ill folks who have a lot of allergies, you may need to go one direction. If you're working with someone who just wants to lower their blood pressure, maybe a whole different equation that you want to push. And then, let's see, what do we have coming up? Oh, we have a whole bunch of these coming up. Again, we'll do these once a month through the end of the year. We have this class starting in September. There'll be one more class starting in November, and then we'll close things down for the year. And um, let's see, is there anything else to tell you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be uh, in Florida at the FCA uh, this weekend. If any of you happen to be Orlando-based, it'd be great to meet you. And then there's also a series of lectures I'm going to be doing for various reasons. I'll be in Salt Lake City, Washington, D.C., uh, Columbus, Ohio, go Ohio State, and um, there's one more I'm forgetting right now. Oh, in Atlanta. Okay, and we have all these dates posted. If you're in any of those cities, D.C., Atlanta, Columbus, or Salt Lake, or if you're Orlando, Florida based, you know, get in touch. It'd be great to meet you in person. I always walk around these seminars looking for people and wanting to talk. That's why I go to them. So it's always a joy to meet people who attend these classes and meet people who uh, I haven't met in person, but you know, just know from the online presence. All right, so I'm going to wrap things up. There's a couple of questions that came in, so let me just try to do those. Uh, let's see. If you want the research study, just email. Um, where's our email contact? It's not on here. Oh, there it is. Sorry, bouncing around. Email uh, info at Kalish Institute. And they'll get it to you. Someone asked for the study. Uh, let's see. Oh, with prostate cancer, I do not use um, DHEA or pregnenolone, and I do not use DHEA or pregnenolone with female hormone-related cancers either. Just to be on the safe side. There's a counter argument to that that uh, DHEA can be count cancer protective, but if it's a hormone related cancer, I do not use the hormones, just to be on the safe side. Um, oh, can, a, can DHEA and pregnenolone be used in a person already taking thyroid and testosterone and biased? Absolutely yes. These low, low, low dosages are mimicking normal production and it will improve thyroid function and improve sex hormone levels and make it easier for you to correct the thyroid and the sex hormones if you've got them on a basic adrenal program, these dosages are super, super low, super, super low. Last question, we're right on the hour. Leanne, uh, do I use DHA or pregnenolone for pregnant or nursing moms? I, I do not. So for pregnancy or nursing, I only recommend a few things. Uh, essential fatty acids, of course, vitamins and minerals, uh, probiotics, digestive enzymes. Um, that's about it. Don't do any hormones. I don't do any hormones when women are pregnant or breastfeeding, and I don't do any of the herbal products that I usually use just to be on the safe side. All right, everyone, have a great evening out there, and I hope to connect with you next month when we have another one of these. Bye for now.